Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly mentoring hour. This session has been recorded. Thank you for getting on this call. And we take this time to engage in asking questions, interact, discuss, uh, uh, and make it a time of learning for all of us. So I just want to request uh, any of us to please lead us in prayer as we get this time started. Can I request Charles to lead us in prayer? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Charles. Right. Let's pray and believe. Father God, we praise you. We honor you. For you allow us to fulfill our plans and desires. You plan things. And you allow us to see them come true. We thank you for this Bible college. We thank you for all that we have done since the year began, since the semester began. And we are here for this mentorship hour, oh Lord. We pray that as you tell us that as iron sharpens iron, so does man sharpen man. We pray that we shall be sharpened, edified, so that we will be able to help the church grow for the glory of your name in jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you charles for praying just one um today we have mrs jean george facilitate the discussion and over to g thank you pastor diana thank you good morning everyone good to have all of you on the call uh, and welcome to this hour of mentoring um, this is a time that we take to address questions that you may have, um, maybe some things that you have learned as part of your course or as part of uh, a ministry uh, that you're leading or even, even the Christian life. Um, so the, uh, the floor is opened for you to uh, put in your questions. You could either unmute yourselves and... Uh, raise a question or even put it up on the chat and uh, we have our faculty here today um, who will we will all do our best to provide you the answers so over to to you um, to put in your questions um, and yes we can take it from there Um, so t in the meantime, till till uh, we're warming up to ask our questions, uh, maybe we'd like to just uh, open this to uh, to any of the students to probably share with us what you've learned through this, maybe this last week or the last ten days, something new that you've learned that uh, that's touched your heart, that's that's helped you apply it in your Christian life, in your Christian walk. Um, maybe you could share that over here. So uh, probably I, I could call upon um, uh, Felician. I'm sorry if I haven't pronounced your name right. Felician, if you're on the call, would you like to share with us anything new that you've learned uh, through this last week or 10 days? Okay, thank you, teacher. Thank you for giving me time. Are you understanding me? Yes, yes, we can follow you. Yes. Uh, I'm very sorry. Maybe I cannot uh, say something because right now our network is very bad. According to us, raining so full. So I, I don't think if he, I don't know if you, if you understand me in very in a good condition because our network is very very few. Felician, we can hear you very well. Please go on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me take this time to thank you, my God, for this opportunity to be at 
this Bible college. And then let me take this time to give my thanks for to all staff and the, all students. So uh, I would like to ask you one question, which is somebody asked me. Uh, as we start and we go out of our, our study to do exercise, to preach and to tell many people according to the good news of Jesus Christ. So I met with the one person and the, that one asked me one question which I would like to share with you. If possible, you can give me explanation more than what I know. Uh, the question is this. The person asked me how people can be freely from sin. Uh, he asked me, somebody I hate to, to, to steal or to make fornication, but he, I meet my, uh, but he meet himself in other sins. So he told me, he told me that he chose to, to stay in sinful because he knows that he, God will forgive the one who will forgive. And God will save the one who will save. That is the that is the words what which he told me. Is it that right? How can I help him? Please, everybody who has more information about this can give me explanation according this issue of this one. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Felician, for the question. Um, I just want to repeat what uh, you've said so that I correctly understood it, I think you've asked as how could uh, one li uh, live a life without sin, even when they are moved to sin, even when there are uh, uh, areas of sin that they may continue in, how could one live a life free of sin? Did I pick that question right, Felician? Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm leaving this open to the faculty, anyone among our faculty who would like to uh, answer the question. Um, may I request uh, either Pastor Paul or Pastor Nancy, uh, would you like to take up the question please? Uh, thank you, Jean. Um, so, Felician, Jean, once again, uh, just to clarify, so Felician is asking, is it right to live in sin for a believer? No. How, how does one not uh, live a life free of sin? How does one live a life free of sin? Okay. How does... Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, G. So, uh, Felician, uh, we see in the word of God that the Lord Jesus has already paid the price for uh, our forgiveness, for our redemption. Uh, and therefore, uh, we can live a life free of sin. So, one thing is for us to understand what the Lord Jesus has done for us. So, when we know that... Uh, you know, we, we already have everything that we need to live a victorious life, then one is able to, um, you know, live free of sin. And also, you know, we have the empowering of the Holy Spirit with us because we know that before the Lord Jesus uh, um, gave his life for us in the Old Testament, the Holy, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is very different. But after, uh, after, Jesus's work on the cross, every believer now also has the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. So we can also be led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that empowers us you know, to live a victorious life. So I think I'll, I'll stop with that, Jean. Maybe others could also add to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to add to uh, what Pastor Nancy said? Uh, Pastor Paul, would you like to add to what Pastor Nancy said? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, so uh, I, I, Pastor Nancy has uh, very uh, briefly answered that most of it. So uh, yes, uh, so we are all empowered by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit 
uh, gives us the strength to overcome temptations. Now we know that, uh, affiliation, that temptations will come, uh, uh, but uh, when we live our life uh, knowing what Jesus did on the cross, knowing that we are walking, we're already in victory. Uh, we're not we're not fighting for victory, but we're walking in victory. Uh, and that uh, revelation, that understanding will really help us uh, to overcome sin. Uh, because the enemy is going to uh, you know, come with temptations and he's going to do his work. But God has, uh, you know, on the cross, he's made us victorious. And so, uh, as Pastor Nancy said, uh, the Holy Spirit inside us will give us the strength. Uh, just want to leave us with this verse, uh, you know, when temptations come, uh, this wonderful verse which says that uh, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And the world refers to uh, the works of the enemy as well. So uh, I'll leave it at this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Felician, I'd just like to add maybe one more point is uh, uh, the basis of our Christian life is because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And uh, our, uh, our victory comes because of what he did on the cross. And, and we are dead to sin because of what he did on the cross. So, uh, so it is, it's a, fo a foundational truth for us to um, every time when we are faced with temptation to, uh, to, uh, to help ourselves understand that by what Jesus did on the cross, he's taken away even the power of sin. And we read that in Ephesians uh, chapter 2. He's taken away the power of sin and that makes us dead to sin because we live with Christ. Yeah. So in addition with that, I just wanted to add those points. Um, Felician, I hope that answered your query. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you, Pastor. I understand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felician, for that question. Uh, we have another question on the chat, and this is uh, by Charles, and, and I'll just read that out. Uh, in Old Testament, priests were not allowed to be impotent or have a rump, etc., uh, I've forgotten the verses, but during this time of grace dispensation, do these things still hold? All right. Um, uh, Pastor, may I please request you to take on this question? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Jay. So, Charles, um, the answer is no. Uh, these things do not apply to us. Um, so in the Old Testament, there were you know, a lot of instructions to the priests, those who served in the temple. And the, the simple example is, uh, I think in Ezekiel, he says, you know, you shouldn't wear anything that causes you to sweat. So, I mean, nowadays, you know, we sweat on the pulpit for so many reasons. I mean, it could be hot weather, whatever. Uh, so that means, you know, you can't be sweating while you're ministering as a priest. Uh, but so like this, you know, there's so many things. The priest had a certain attire, a certain robe. He had to do certain things. Now, none of those things carry over into the New Testament because one, the New Testament tells us very clearly that um, uh, we have been, uh, uh, we are no longer under the law. Uh, I just, uh, let me just uh, post a few uh, references there, right? So, uh, so we are no longer under the law. We are under grace. Uh, we are dead to the law. Romans chapter 7, verse 6 says, uh, Galatians 5.18 says, uh, we, walk, we live in the spirit, we don't live by the law. So the answer is no, uh, those things do not apply to us. Um, we are still priests, meaning uh, th there are many parallels in, in, in the Old and the New. Old Testament, God had priests. In the New Testament, we are priests. But our role as priests is very different. In the New Testament, every believer is a priest, and uh, the focus is on the spiritual ministry that we are called to do. So Hebrews 13 says we offer, offer up spiritual sacrifices as opposed to what they did under the old covenant. So the short answer uh, is no, those things don't apply because our role has, uh, as priests has been redefined uh, in Jesus Christ. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Um, Charles, I hope that addressed your question. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm helped. Thank you, Charles. 
Thank you. Okay, we have uh, another question that's uh, raised by John. Um, I'll read out the question. It says, could you share some light on Matthew eleven twelve? In the NKGV, it is translated as, as from the days of John the Baptist, um, uh, until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. In the NLT version, uh, it reads, and from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and violent people are attacking it. My question is, who is the violent people mentioned here? Is it us or people in the world who want to, dis to destroy the works of the kingdom? I have heard some interpretations saying it denotes we forcefully advance, we denotes we forcefully advancing in kingdom. Okay. Um, so, so John, just to clarify, it, uh, did your did your question that interpretation mean that we as believers are the ones who forcefully advance the kingdom? So you would like to yeah, do yeah. it, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm opening this out to the faculty for uh, anyone to take up the question. Yeah, John. So, um, a good. Pastor, you're on mute, Pastor. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So when when we have a text like this, where you know we're not very sure, um, uh, so that two things we can do: one is we look at the context, you know, like what led into Jesus making this statement, so that. Um, then it kind of gives us an idea, you know, okay, oh, he said this because, right? So when you look at Matthew chapter 11, um, all the way from verses 1 to 12, you look at the context. Uh, this is the context in which he made the statement. So therefore, we can understand what he was trying to say. That's one thing we can do. The second thing we can do is to read the same verse translation in many versions of the Bible. And uh, that's a very helpful thing to do uh, because the, the translators have put in a lot of work already for us uh, to try to arrive at the right meaning. So you can look at translations that are close to the Greek and also you can look at translations that are interpretive in their approach like the Passion Translation and others. And uh, a common, what you would find, I mean, other than what, what has been quoted there, the NLT, a majority of the texts, if you look at it, they, the interpretation is that the kingdom of God is advancing forcefully and people are pressing into it. So the idea of violence is about us people who want to enter into the kingdom. There has to be violence or you could, some versions, you know, passion, or there has to be that uh, uh, that sense of pressing in from our side to enter into the kingdom. So that's kind of the thing. Also, if you look at the context, what was the context? The context is the first part of the Matthew. Uh, the context is John the Baptist asks, is asking about Jesus. You know, are you the one or should we look for another? That means, are you the one who's going to help us enter into the kingdom? Or is it going to be somebody else? Context. Jesus says, go tell John what you hear and see. Yeah, uh, The blind see, the lame walk. And he talks about the miracles and the gospel being preached. So the preceding verse is that the idea is John the Baptist asking the question, are you the one or should we look for somebody else? Are you the one who's going to usher in the kingdom? Are you the one who's going to make the kingdom available to us? Or do we look for somebody else? So the whole context is about us being able to enter into the kingdom, experience the kingdom. And then after that, Jesus comments about John. He says, you know, John is like the forerunner and, and so on. So uh, both the context and look, and I'm, I'm saying this very quickly, but both the context and the various versions of the Bible bring out uh, this singular meaning, which is God's kingdom is advancing and people need to press in to it. Um, uh, and, and why do we need to press into it? It's because there are a lot of things that are trying to restrain us. Uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil are restraining forces, trying to keep people from entering into the kingdom. And so if we have to enter into the kingdom, we have to press in. 
but the kingdom is also forcefully advancing. Is that okay, John? Yes, Pastor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, John, for that question. Um, we'll take up the next uh, question by Herbert. Uh, he's written, about sin, I have a worry. However much Jesus paid for our sin, I think when you die, and when you're not saved, then you die in sin and you go to hell. Not so. Um, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you're making a comment here or a question or, or a reference to a point that was made earlier. Uh, so you, you're, you're right that if we are not saved, uh, we die in sin and we do not have eternal life. That, but it's only through the Father, only through Jesus, only through, save, um, through belief in him uh, as your savior, do you have eternal life? Uh, so that is the reference that was made even earlier. Was there any other doubt on that, Herbert? Uh, not really. Not really. I just wanted to be sure that maybe it is automatic that if you that if you if Jesus died for us, then it is an, an automatic go through to to heaven without believing in Him. Thank you. No, um, I think I just want to clarify and. Uh, reiterate that it is only faith in him that takes us to eternal life that uh, that brings us to heaven all those who do not believe and who uh, die in sin um, do not have eternal life that's what scripture says so i hope that's clear herbert okay uh, we'll move up to the next one uh, that sitkenu has uh, written a question um, I wanted to know, um, in the Bible, God loves Israel more than any other nation. God says, Israel are my people. Uh, then what, hap what happens that today only 2% of the people are in, uh, in Israel are Christians? 2% um, of the people are Christians. Uh, and what is the thing that India is lacking as we see that there is a revival in the Western and African countries? There is something which we as a nation is lacking. Is it holiness, belief, or anything else? So, Sitkenu, um, what I what I understand from your question is, um, what 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 is it that is lacking in India that does not um, that does not keep us as favored as Israel? Is that what you're meaning to ask? Could could I just have clarity in your question? Actually, ma'am, my question have two faces. One is about Israel and one is about the rest of the India. Okay. Okay. So you, you'd want to know why is Israel the chosen nation? That's the first one, I think. And second is why isn't revival happening in India like it is in other Western or African countries? Is it because of a lack? These are your two questions. Yes, ma'am. Yes, oh, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Right. So the the first question on why is Israel the chosen one? Uh, if I'm right, this was um, uh, uh, this was addressed. If I think the week or the week before this this was addressed. Um, so what can I just may I please request uh, any of the pastors to address these two questions. There are two questions. Uh, one was addressed, so Sidkenu, maybe I'd, I'd suggest if, if you could uh, just look back at last week's recording, you would have uh, a perfect answer to this because this was addressed uh, last week. And we could go on to the second one if that is okay as to why is India not seeing the revival like other countries and is, is it something that we lack? Uh, I'm opening this question to the pastors or anybody uh, to address?
Uh, anyone can take up the question, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Um, yes, it could. Have. So um, the second part of your question about revival in India, uh, or for that matter, revival in any part of the world. Uh, just to, just to point, you know. So uh, well, I guess one of the things we can do is to look back and learn from history. Uh, so there have been revivals and. Uh, moves of God, even in India, uh, when we look back in uh, history of the church in India, uh, there have been moves of the Spirit. And also, uh, we can see that, uh, say, for instance, in Punjab, that part of the, our country, especially in the last recent times, I would say the recent decade, or at least the last five years, uh, there has been a significant move uh, of the spirit. So uh, the answer is, I guess, the same for every country. It's, it's a matter of us praying, uh, seeking God, and being willing to do the things uh, God wants us to do, uh, to see revival. Right. So uh, while we are going about doing our, you know, our regular things, uh, if God's people pray, seek Him. Um, so the the answer to having revival is the same in every part of the world, and uh, we need to do that here in our country as well. Is that okay? Is it, you know? Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Elisha's question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, Elisha has a question. Uh, he says, would there be VIPs and VVIPs in heaven? So would there be very important people and very, very important people in heaven? Um, opening the question to any of our faculty to answer. Um, Pastor Roshan, would you like to take that question? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Um, I think uh, in short, I would say, have to say no, but uh, there are a lot of things that comes to uh, our mind uh, in terms of, uh, for example, in Revelation, we see that uh, every tribe and every tongue, every nation, we come together in unity and, and we worship. Um, so there is no really, um, there is diversity, but there, there is un unity. And I think even in I mean, Galatians, uh, we see um, the Word of God is making it very clear in Galatians 3, chapter 3, I think, it says, um, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither, uh, you know, uh, slave or free, um, but something. But yeah, I mean, there is no separation or division. Um, and again, and Paul goes on to St. Romans, so we are many, we are one body, we are one body in Christ. Um, so uh, we are all one uh, in Jesus, and uh, we are all his sons and daughters. And uh, so, and I I hope that's uh, enough to support saying that no, there will not be VIP or VIPs. Yeah, others can feel free to add to it, please. That's just my understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Roshan. Uh, uh, Elisha, I, I just want to bring up a verse of uh, Romans 8 17 um, that says, uh, um, if, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Uh, and I think that this just uh, helps us understand that all of us who, uh, who believe in him uh, sit with him, sit alongside with him. And that's, that's the um, privilege that he gives each one who is called by his name. So even I would think that answer is no. Um, that we all have the very same importance in God's eyes. And the only marker is our trust, our, our faith in him. Our relationship with him is the only marker to have uh, that place of importance of being as with God and joint as with Christ. <clears throat> is there anyone else who would like to uh, pitch in? Any, any other thoughts? Uh, any other pastors would like to pitch in? Please be free to do so. Uh, Jean, actually, I have a follow-up question to Elisha's question. Uh, if uh, Elisha, I mean, if uh, he's okay with the answer already, 
then I can ask my question. Elisha, are you all right with the answer? If if so, mm, not 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 fully, but I, I think maybe Pastor Nice's question would would bring much clarity. So I okay. think yes. Pastor Nice's question should come. Go ahead, oh. Pastor Nice. Okay, okay, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Jean. Thank you, Elisha. So my question is: Yes, uh, I agree with uh, Pastor Ocean and uh, Jean that there'll be no VIPs, VVIPs in heaven. We all are uh, equal in Christ Jesus. But uh, I want to know, based on um, the calling that God has given people. For example, you know, there are like Elijah and Moses and uh, Abraham. Uh, they're recognized. So, I mean, how does that work? So there are some people who are recognized. Uh, I don't know if you uh, want to use the word, you know, they've fulfilled their calling. So is there a separate standing that such people have in heaven? Just wanted to know. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, just to, I mean, just to uh, bring in some more what we see in scripture. So, uh, you know, the fact is we are all one in Christ. We are all saved by the blood. Um, but what we do see is, for, for example, there are 24 elders around the throne. Uh, that means 24 people get to sit in those thrones and it's only 24. Uh, and uh, we can, you know, we know that uh, uh, these 24 elders are, are redeemed people. Uh, both, uh, I mean, you see this in uh, later on in Revelation 19 and verse 10, and then also Revelation 22, uh, I think it's verse 9 or something, where when John falls down to worship the elder, the elder says, look, I'm just one of your fellow servants. Uh, I'm of your people. And uh, in Revelation 22, he says, I'm one of the prophets. So, uh, yeah, and Jesus also told his apostles in Matthew 19, he said, you know, I, each one of you will be sitting on thrones. Now, so we're all believers. We all, um, you know, and to, the, to every overcomer, there's a crown, there is a throne. Uh, and this is in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. So the overcomers also promised these things. But then there are only 24 people who will be sitting around the elders. Only 24 elders will be sitting around Jesus. And uh, while we don't know the names of these 24 elders, it most likely would be the 12 apostles and uh, 12 Old Testament people. We don't know who they are. Uh, you know, so... They are honored, so those 24 people are honored to be there. Um, does that make them better than us? Uh, I, I, it doesn't make them any different from us. We're all people saved by the blood. We all wear the same white robes. Um, but I just think in terms of the rewards and in terms of the honor that's given to people, so you know, staying consistent with the fact that what Roshan and she have already said that we're all saved equally. Um, the honor that we are receive in heaven will differ based on the works, you know, uh, the, the the works that are tested, and also based on it, some of the things that we see. Obviously, is the twenty four elders who are chosen. So, in that sense, uh, I, I I wouldn't call this being VIP. We're not going to be treated in sense differently, but it's the honor that comes on our lives, uh, which could differ because of the, uh, um, the, the way each one has served the Lord, the rewards that are given, the crowns that are given. And secondly, the, you know, the 24 elders were picked. So I would just kind of add that into the mix of what has been said and Thank you, Pastor Elisha. I hope that uh, the follow-up question adds clarity to what you were looking for. Yes, yes, um, there's clarity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Elisha. Thank you. 
Uh, we have another question um, by uh, Felician. Um, her question is, we know well that we are saved in God's grace and mercy, and we believe in Jesus Christ, but sometimes we meet ourselves in sin, which we didn't expect. So if I meet myself in sin and death meets up in that sin immediately, and I don't have time to repent, what will be my place? Okay, so her question is, if you are in sin at the time you meet with death and you don't have time to repent, what would happen? That is a physician's question. Um, I'm opening this up to the faculty to answer. Um, Pastor Diana or Pastor Paul, would any of you like to take up the question? Sure, thank you, uh, Jean. Thank you, Felician, for that question. Um, I would like to start off by saying that uh, the Bible teaches us that uh, once we accept the Lord Jesus as our personal Savior, we believe in what he has done for us on the cross, and we ask for forgiveness, ask for repentance. Uh, the Bible teaches us that uh, we are a new creation, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Uh, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Now, uh, we are a new creation in our spirit. And as you mentioned, yes, uh, as human beings, uh, temptation will come. And so to answer your question, you know, while in sin, if death comes, what will be our, uh, you know, the outcome? Uh, I would say, Felician, that uh, the very fact that we've accepted the Lord as our personal savior, uh, and we have, you know, uh, we believe in the work that he did on the cross. That is salvation. And so even during the course of our life, we will go through temptations. Uh, so I, I believe that this is my opinion. Uh, the other faculty can add as well. Uh, but I believe that God is not going to judge us for that one sin. Um, and as you said, you did not have the opportunity to you know, ask for forgiveness because at the moment of sin, death came in. Uh, but God is not going to, you know, uh, forsake all that happened in the past in the meaning that, meaning uh, the moment you accepted Christ and uh, you know, walk with Christ. Uh, so all of that is not going to be just, you know, wiped away just because of that one sin. I believe that uh, the Lord will, uh, you know, be gracious and he will uh, accept you as his child because you have, uh, you know, receive the call of salvation into your life. So uh, I, I would leave it open to the other faculty to uh, get their thoughts as well. Thank you so much. For this. Thank, you. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Um, would anyone else like to add any other thoughts, any other faculty, any other thoughts? Felician, do you, would, do you, did you have your answer? Did you get your answer? Okay, Felician, we're unable to hear you. Um, all right, I, we'll go on to the next question. We have just a couple of minutes. Yes, Felician, uh, yes, go, go ahead. Not yet. I just, I, I'm just on the thing. Let me leave you the place to another person. Thank you. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll go on to the next question. Uh, so Sitkin has brought about a question. Uh, can you explain the Gnostics of the New Testament? Uh, I asked the elder of my church, um, uh, can you please explain a bit more for clarity uh, as to how they are different from the Protestant? Uh, Pastor, may I um, have, uh, ask you to please answer this? Yeah, so the um, so uh, Sitkin, uh, the Gnostics, um, it is very prevalent uh, during, let's say, the end of the the first century, uh, and then coming on into the second century of, um, you know, uh, second century, and uh, it's because of this 
uh, even you find in the writings of the Apostle John, in, in the episodes of John, how he warns the believers, you know, that uh, there are many antichrists who have gone. So be careful about these. Everyone who deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is antichrist and so on. So you read about this in First John chapter 4. And, and you find that burden of the Apostle John in, in all three of his episodes. But essentially, what are the Gnostics? They believe in secret knowledge. So Gnosticism uh, is that they believe in uh, privileged revelation, secret knowledge. That means they, the, the essence of it is uh, others don't have access to this. This is something very secret. Uh, we have this uh, knowledge, uh, understanding, revelation, right? So, and uh, then from that come, come out all kinds of uh, er erroneous teachings and so on. Uh, so that's who they were in the group. Um, you know, they were very privileged. Whereas the New Testament is an unveiling. It's a revelation of who Christ is. Uh, and and who he is, and so they, you know, some of the very fundamental teachings of of the New Testament that Christ came in the flesh, Christ died, his bodily resurrection, all of that, you know, were being challenged in those days, and they had to be protected. Whereas the Protestant, uh, the Protestant is something way later. Yes, you know, we come come into Martin Luther's time, which is uh, around four fourteen hundred. Uh, 1478 or something, or 1500. Uh, so you come, you're coming, you know, you're all, almost traveling 1500 years ahead into time. Uh, when with Martin Luther came the Reformation uh, of the Church, and from them, from thereafter, you know, the, the the tag or the name Protestant was given because they were protesting against the practices during that time. So, you know, they're, they're, these are two different periods in time history, in, in church history. And, um, and and today, you know, when they, today the label Protestant simply means that, that that branch of Christianity that believes, let's say, stemming from the Reformation um, that began from the time of Martin Luther. Is that okay? Thank you very much, Pastor. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for, again, for that uh, uh, question and Pastor for the answer. Uh, we have a question from Zillatoli. Uh, do we get a new name in heaven? Uh, I think this is based on uh, one of the verses in Revelation 2, uh, 17. Uh, would would somebody like to take up this question? Would any of the faculty like to take up the question? Revelation two seventeen. Uh, Zilatoli, was was that your reference? I'm sorry, I I just I I, I just uh, checked and so is that was that your reference and was that where your question was coming from? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, anybody would like to take up the uh, question, please? Yeah, so, so, uh, so the answer obviously is yes. Uh, you know, so the scriptures there, uh, uh, Revelation two, one of the one of the rewards to the overcomer is the Lord says he will receive. I mean, he or she will receive a new name, which nobody knows except that person, the Lord and that person. Then again, you find other things like in Revelation twenty two, it says the name of the Lord will be written on our foreheads. So, yeah. So the answer is uh, yes. Uh, if you want to keep your own name, <laughs> your earthly name, uh, there is a, no, I'm just joking. I don't know what to do. But... <laughs> All right, thank you, Pastor. All right, uh, I hope that answered your question, Zilatoli. Uh, all right, uh, we have a couple of minutes, five minutes, uh, so we could do with a, a single question question if anybody has one.
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for all those of you who joined. Thank you for all your questions, students, and uh, for all the answers, pastors. Thank you that this has been a time of learning and uh, just enriching our uh, spirits and our uh, knowledge of the word. May I please request any one of the students to close in prayer? Um, uh, Tarun, uh, if you are available and would you like to please close in prayer okay uh, yeah father thank you lord thank you for this time that where we could spend uh, uh, pondering through the thoughts uh, of on your word and understanding things uh, much more deeply lord we thank you for all the answers that have been received uh, uh, we know that it is uh, you and the, your spirit who helps us uh, understand you deeply uh, with uh, deep interpretations of your word and the things around, Lord. Uh, you are the source of all the wisdom. We thank you for uh, what you have blessed us with. Uh, uh, we, we thank you and we uh, submit the rest of the day as we learn uh, totally onto you, knowing that uh, you are the source of all wisdom. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Tarun. Thank you all for joining in. Have a blessed day. See you all at class. God bless. Thank you.